Hello, and welcome to Cartel Aristocrats cast number 84. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Gathering Magic and CoolStuffInc.com, who have provided us, provided us with gift certificates to give away. With free shipping on orders of $100 or more, a 25% buy list bonus, and their ever-popular customer rewards program, Cool Stuff Inc. is a store for all of your Magic the Gathering needs. I'm joined this week, of course, with my co-host, Ed Wynn of Kerwin's Gaming, Jim Caselli of Modern Nexus and Quiet Speculation, and Travis Allen of MTG Price and MTG Fast Finance. How are you guys doing? Yeah. I guess they're doing okay. Uh, before Lovely. we... St- Before we start off with this cast, we just wanted to give an announcement to uh, people that are listening. Um, Three of us will be at GP Toronto this upcoming week, along with Douglas Johnson of Brainstorm Brewery and Corbin Hustler of Brainstorm Brewery. Uh, If you guys want to say hi to any of us or maybe get a t-shirt, follow us on cartel underscore finance for a chance to meet up with us on site. Some other guys are going to be up there. Doug Johnson of Brainstorm Brewery and Corbin Hustler of Brainstorm Brewery and Jason All of Brainstorm Brewery and Marcel of Brainstorm Brewery of Brainstorm Brewery. Um, Jason and Marcel. They're from different brainstorm breweries, so we just had to specify. Um, yeah. Uh, but Ed, Travis, and I will be up at GP Toronto. At some point, we will be on site, though I'm not quite sure exactly what our plans are yet. Um, but if you listen to the cast and you want to say hi and pick our brains, I know Ed really likes hugs. Uh, we've been over this many times. Moving on, however, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on lately. The Pro Tour just ended. It was modern, which was unbearable for me to watch. Um, but we did have Lantern Control take it down with a sweet Mardu Pyromancer sort of build by Jerry Thompson coming in second. Um, as a result of Five Color Humans and other things popping, we're starting to see the Five Color Humans deck foils get bought out. Cavern of Souls is also taking up in price, which is a card that, you know, what, what would this card be at without the Modern Masters 2017 reprint? It is just absolutely crazy that uh, it continues to go up, though I'm sure, as Ed knows, the demand is definitely there for a card that's that expensive. Um, There wasn't really that much else that moved. Mox Opal didn't budge that much from Lantern winning. Bridge uh, and Snaring Bridge didn't go up that much. But was there anything that uh, you guys noticed, since you're more attuned to the modern format, from these results in what was popular and what has been popping? Ed's first, but he's eating, so Jim should go. Uh, sure. So um, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is that uh, Aaron Forsyth like, basically immediately tweeted out after the Pro Tour that uh, a deck winning doesn't mean that a card is going to get banned, which is important because um, I, many of the modern Pro Tours at this point have had cards banned from the winning deck. Uh, such that they have not had a repeat winner because, with the exception of the blue red, no, I guess the blue red Eldrazi deck got Ivy been banned. Nope, just all of the decks have gotten a card banned at some point in time. Um, a lot of people really don't like Lantern; they think it's uninteractive and boring to play against and boring to play with. So, a lot of people are calling for something from that deck to be banned, but it looks like it's going to be some sailing from here. Uh, i has got food in his mouth again. You ready? Yeah, I got this. Okay. No, I got this. (laughs) Um, so I think like one of the things that people can really take away from this tournament and from my perspective as trying to be as objective as possible is that I still stand by my previous statements that modern is pretty miserable to watch, but the good games of modern are very, very, very good. Like, I think if you watch the semifinals, watching um, Jerry Thompson play against Pascal, uh, like, don't, I, that is what good gameplay looks like. And I think that is more of what Mar needs to be. Um, the finals, like, it's whatever. Lantern does its thing. The thing that people don't really understand about Lantern is the game is. 100% what happens before Lantern gets to having its three lock pieces. If you want to sit there and you hope that they have that 1% chance that they screw up, that they miss mill, or that you, your deck somehow comes up with, you know, six answers in a row on top of your deck and they can't, and they don't have enough mill rocks to take care of them, more power to you. But Lantern is fine. Um, we just need to see some better gameplay. I'm not sure banning anything out of Lantern is the way to go like there's 
the most compelling argument is ancient stirrings. I think the card selection there is a little bit too powerful on that card. Um, that's really the only one that might be on the radar. I, I think realistically, if something had to go, my pick would be um, Ancient Stirrings. I think hitting Mox Opal, while reasonable, I think it hits Affinity a little bit too hard. And Affinity is type the type of deck where it's always going to be on people's radar. You don't ever want to skim on your artifact hate, but it's never going to just do anything necessarily more busted than it already does. And it's unlikely to be a better than it already is. Uh, yeah, so, if, I mean, if we're going to talk about whether or not cards are getting banned, there's, I don't really, definitely, nothing's getting banned for Modern at this point. Lantern is really low percentage online. Um, it's not taking over the format or anything. There's a ton of tools to fight it. It's very easy to interact with. And if you envision a scale of uh, gameplay patterns that Wizards wants to encourage, we know that Lantern is definitely on the lower end of that scale. Uh, you think of the, the absolute lowest end of that scale, the zero being eggs where one player plays for 25 minutes uh, and the other, you know, the best, the top level of that scale is like, you know, what a good standard format looks like where people attack and block and cast spells. Uh, and Lantern is definitely on the lower end of that, but it's not obnoxious. It doesn't take forever. Um, it, it can close out games in a semi-reasonable time, as long as it's not playing against another prison deck. So I don't think you're getting, you're going to see anything toss out the window. Mox Opal is the most likely candidate, I would say. Maybe ancient stirrings if they wanted to be more a little more targeted, but again, I, I wouldn't worry about any of that at this point. It was a, I thought it was from what from what I caught of it was interesting. Humans I think was one of the more interesting stories. You know that deck broke out at a, like a Star City Open what like three months ago, and everyone's like, "Is this real? We don't know if humans is good enough." And then here we are a couple months later, and I just want a pro tour. So modern or humans really we saw the whole evolution of that deck over the last six months or something like that. The hollow one deck also showed up uh, that did pretty well too so um that's pretty cool you might see that more at your local store that's a little more a little more narrow than humans so i don't think you're going to see that as much at your local store because humans is really accessible for players it's something they can see themselves picking up and playing for a long time the hollow one deck is going to kind of wax and wane as uh as graveyard hate shows up but that was i was kind of cool to see those it was not the like tron eldrazi burn metagame that kind of people were a little afraid of i think this was the best modern pro tour we've had I think the other thing to mention about the Hall One deck is it's very easy to buy those pieces because um, Cavern of Souls really makes the human deck work. Ether Vial really makes the human deck work, unless you're going big with the human deck, at least from what I've seen from customers buying that deck. Whereas a lot of modern players at our shop will buy the Hall One pieces and like all the discard pieces and the thought seizes but they'll play more basics or they won't play optimal lands. Like um, what's that red, black, land, uh, black cleave cliffs. They won't play that. Like they'll save that for later, but it, overall it's a cheaper deck that they can play around and budget with versus humans where you really need those $30 artifacts and $60 ca or 50 to $60 cavern of souls to be able to play the deck correctly. Um, it's a little harder to play the deck without optimal mana for five color humans than it is to just have a couple extra swamps and um, mountains in your deck for hollow one. So it's just something to keep in mind. And again, one, it's once again, that's just information that I'm seeing from players buying cards from me. It might be different in your local area, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and Thalia has so much demand across all formats that it's just a great card that it's been really cool to see that card's price trend, though I do think it gets reprinted this year at some point. I mean, we'll see, but I think it's a shoe in for something. Um, anything else you guys want to touch on about Modern or the Pro Tour in general? Sean McLaren won Grand Prix Valencia in 2014, and he has no banned cards in his deck. Jim said that and made me want to go look. I was like, wait, there's they have not banned a card from every Modern Pro Tour winning deck. Sean yeah, McLaren I, I forgot about that one. It's the blue white deck, right? Or the white, right, white. Yeah. yeah, that that's like the fairest that you could possibly have ever gotten at any point in time. I mean, you could argue that the the 2015 it was a Snapcaster deck, but it wasn't it didn't get banned or it was a twin deck, but didn't get banned until Alex Bianchi won GP Pittsburgh a couple months later, but they might have already decided what they were gonna do at that point. What did Sif go in with in, at Ravnica? Blue Red Eldrazi, maybe? No, no, no. This was... Uh, oh, he was on Ravnica. eggs. 
right? Uh, yeah, it was eggs. Yeah, that was eggs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't remember watching that. Um, <laughs> it must have been miserable. <laughs> and then I'll just leave. You probably didn't watch it. That's probably what happened. It was in Seattle, so like time zone matched. I don't know. I don't remember that. And then I'll leave our listeners with just one more thing in that there were 46,000 people watching the Pro Tour for the finals. Um, that's like the biggest that they've ever gotten as far as coverage is concerned. So it means that there's a lot of players that are looking into modern. Uh, prices should be going up harder at this point. We haven't really seen that as much, uh, though I do hope that continues in the next couple of months with all these modern Grand Prix coming up. But we'll see what happens to prices. It's going to be interesting for sure. It's it's like, you know, it's funny that you say that like, oh, they had the most viewers they've ever had. And it was like, what'd you say, like 47,000 or something like that? It, it, it's equal to less than half of some of the most popular League of Legends streamers on yeah. like at like midnight. Right. So I play PUBG and yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a streamer that stopped streaming for a while because he cheated on his wife and came back today for the Dr. first time. Disrespect. Dr. Disrespect. He's, he's not a good whatever. I don't care for him, but that's aside the point. I checked out his stream right at the start just because I was curious to see like you know, him coming back uh, and he had 350,000 <laughs> viewers. And even now at seven o'clock Eastern, it's been five hours since he started. He's at like 120,000. Magic's got a long way to go. Um, yeah, it's going to be definitely interesting to see what Magic's battle screech is uh, coming up for their marketing. And speaking of battle screeches, we've started to see movement in the popper scene. Uh, things like, Chainer's Edict are now popping as well. You can find these anywhere between 6 and $8. A lot of vendors have raised their buy price on this uh, quote-unquote common because it was uncommon uh, in paper the first time. Um, Battle Screech, of course, is moving up in price. We're seeing things like Gush go absolutely crazy. I mean, if you have those sitting around, you can get 5 to $6 for a Gush right now. At some point, this card's got to be reprinted. But Pauper continues to be popular, and it's something that people should keep in mind when they're buying bulk lately. Jim? Oh, sorry. I was just going to make one quick point that, like, Battle Screech has always been uncommon in paper. It's only been common online. Battle Screech has never been reprinted. It's only okay. been printed once in Judgment, I believe. Yeah, Ed, are you starting to see a lot more sales for Popper on your online stores and in paper, or is this something that you think is only confi confined to certain areas? I've definitely seen it online. Like, we were definitely, uh, there were definitely things. We have a bunch of sets, old sets are just kind of sitting. We're just kind of waiting to have them online, mainly because we were so backed up on work. Uh, as soon as a lot of the Popper uh, cards started to take off, we just went through. Like, I remember we went through Judgment. We found, like, a million prismatic strands, for example. Um, we definitely took, like, we picked up the Mercade Mass Box and found, like, no shortage of, you know, obviously Gush, but there were things that have slowly been accumulating that we just hadn't gone to, like, Spore Frogs, those type of things. Um, so it's it's definitely not isolated, and it's been pretty spread out. It It's more than just... A flash in the pan type thing. That's kind of that's kind of what uh, Frontier felt like for a period where everyone was going crazy about you know the very specific cards, mainly because there's no secret about them. But now I think we're starting to see more of a natural demand, and it's actually causing cards to to just slowly creep up, kind of in response to what people are actually playing, as opposed to hey, these cards are spiking. And then they just settle back down as they as people flood the market with them. It's actually people are buying them and people are actually keeping them. I, I hope to play with them. I hope people aren't just buying cards for the sake of buying cards. But um, it, mainly the biggest thing is it's been pretty steady. And whenever we do find these things, we just kind of put them online right away, price them pretty aggressively, and they've they've had no problem moving. Travis, anything that you want to add about the pauper market? Nope. Okay, well, moving on to things that will surely make us money. Modern Masters 25, or the 25th edition of Masters, uh, was spoiled. We have Jace the Mind Sculptor again, and Azusa Lost But Seeking. And the third card is either going to be Platinum Imperion, or Darksteel Colossus, or something like that. Arcbound Ravager. You think it's Arcbound Ravager? It's been since Modern Masters. I mean, I think it's, it's Steel Overseer. It's, it like, could... Ravager has been never, never been printed in, like, a like a human form 
I guess is the best way to describe it. Well, it does seem odd that they would recommission new art for Ravager again when they've got the Modern Masters art. So it might be something like that. But it's hard to imagine it's like it could be Blight Steel Colossus. Didn't look like Blight Steel Colossus. Didn't look Nufrexian ish enough. Either way, Jason Mind Sculpture is going to continue to drop, which means as that card gets lower in price, a lot more players are going to start putting that in their commander deck. A lot more players will will be able to reason or like say, yeah, it's no longer a hundred and fifty dollar card. I want to buy this. Um, I think this is one of the reprints that I'm happiest with, especially if this card gets unbanned in modern, which is a whole nother discussion. I'm going to sell way more $40 Jaces than I will $70 Jaces, and I sold way more $70 Jaces than I did $150 Jaces. So I'm very happy with this reprint. I can understand why people would be mad that Wizards is reprinting their quote-unquote blue chip stocks of their collections because there's a thread on that that a lot of people were talking about. Um, but I'm just happy that all the stuff that's not on the reserve list is getting reprinted uh, because there's a lot of arguments right now in WPN groups and stuff like that, that Wizards should play off the reprints a little bit um, of like a lot of cards that shops have sitting on their, their shelves, but shops are going to make way more money with these reprints and the new border and the, the hollow stamp and all the other stuff Uh churning these cards and that's where i think shop should be at is is selling a bunch of them at lower margins rather than having something set on your case for two months and then that one guy comes in and buys it but it takes two months to move that card how do you guys feel about jace and azusa as reprints azusa is one of those cards where i think it's fine being reprinted uh jace is kind of an odd animal i wonder if that's more to keep their options open in the event that we do see a Jace unbanning in Modern, which is clearly speculation, by the way. I have no idea of if he is or not. Um, He's lying. But because I think one of the biggest problems they could potentially face is that if Jace was to be unbanned and they uh, did not have an uh, incoming reprint, then Jace would just spike up to $100 plus or whatever, purely on speculation alone irrelevant whether or not it'll actually be good uh in modern which is a whole different argument itself but i think it's kind of it feels like it's a little bit too soon and i i think it's a, a bit more speculation i think there are reprints if they're looking at truly a 20 fit uh 25 year master type set i think there are cards more along the lines of azusa that are price based purely on scarcity rather than actual demand. And I feel like those some of those cards might have been a better fit. Iconic had some of them. Um, the uh, Praetor Cycle is kind of a good example. I think we had mentioned it last week. Shieldred, Voron Clicks, they kind of fall in that same category. Azusa falls in that same boat. I feel like some of them might have been a little bit more attractive to reprint rather than Jace, since that does kind of take up a mythic slot. That being said, Iconic also had cards like Channel, so who, who knows what Wizards game plan is at this point, but uh, Azusa is the type of card that if demand, or if supply is more or less readily available, Azusa will probably be like a sub-15, a 10 to $15 card rather than uh, where it is right now. I'm a big fan of, of reprinting cards that are not necessarily competitive staples, but also sometimes are competitive staples. I, I, it's a hard like way to describe those kinds of cards. Like Azus is not the kind of thing that you see of a four of in every modern deck, but occasionally it shows up in some amount of numbers and is a lot, pretty expensive based mostly on its scarcity. Um, so I enjoy cards like that. Like I think that another card that I would like to be have reprinted in this set, especially, is Oracle of Moldiah, which is another card that like very scarcely sees play in modern but is also a great casual card, so it appeals to more than one type of person. It's different than, like, Mishra's Bobble, which is almost exclusively for people that are playing Modern, and once you own those, it's like, they're not very attractive to other customers. So I think that's why they reprinted Jace. Like, they want, they, I think they realized that some some people were disappointed with Masters 25, because or, sorry, Iconic Masters, because it was kind of all over the place, and... If you're going to try to celebrate your 25th anniversary with a master set, you should probably have all the best cards that you can reprint in that, which 
it, you know, Ma uh, Iconic Masters didn't have any Planeswalkers, right? If I remember correctly. I don't remember. It did not. Yeah, like, it would be very surprising to me if they didn't reprint, like, another one of the most expensive Planeswalkers. Like, it would not be... I would be surprised if we didn't see a Liliana of the Veil or Karn Liberated reprint in this set, to be honest. Like, you want this site to be exciting. You want the set to, to celebrate you know, the 25th anniversary of Magic, you want it to sell well. Um, this is not a year that has a modern master set because it's even even year. So maybe they're going to cut back. Maybe they're going to just do one big master set and not have two master sets this year. I don't know. But Jace leads me to believe that they're not going to do, like, an Eternal Masters this year. So they're just kind of... They, they just want to make this set as good as possible. And I, I think that's a good way to start it. I mean... The right way to do this set would have not would have been to not do Eternal Masters into Iconic Masters into Masters 25 so that you had reprints left that people cared about. But that's not what they did. So they're going to do, I guess, just expensive cards that people might want. I mean, they've been all over the place on what these are supposed to be. So who knows? Um I don't know. I, I don't really have a thought. I, I don't know where to go with this. Like, I don't know what they're trying to do with it. I have a feeling that these masters were shoved down their throats by the higher ups at Hasbro and like Rosewater and whoever's developed. And that's probably not Rosewater. Whoever's designing these sets is like, these are stupid and we don't want to do them, but we have to. So they're just throwing crap at the wall and seeing what sticks. In any case, uh, I don't think they're going to unban Jason Modern. I still think that card is way too good. And if you think otherwise, then either you weren't playing when that card was legal and standard or you weren't paying attention. But this, you know, between the Eternal, was it Eternal Masters or Iconic Masters? Who even knows? Between whichever one of those had Jace and a Masters 25 Jace reprint, that might be enough supply that they could unban him if they wanted to. I've, I've long said, as Ed alluded to, or as Ed pointed out as well, I've long said that like the major barrier to Jace getting unbanned in modern isn't even how good he would, he, he would be. It's that prices would become insane overnight if they're, you know, without more copies. Well, this is like a second reprinting outside of the, you know, the FTB set and then these two. So now maybe there'll be enough supply that they feel like they could unban if they wanted to. So that's more on the table than it used to be. Even still, I, I don't see that happening. Um, I mean, be wrong wizards loves to prove me wrong overall though i don't know master 25 i have no interest or excitement in any of these left like they're just all over the place who cares anymore like no one can even tell me what the mythics were and iconic masters and eternal masters like just no one cares because they just pump them out they bug me well i guess eternal masters must have bugged you then because that's when xanthid swarm is from travis that's the only one that had the bug in it um and eternal masters also had jace moving on i guess since uh travis wanted to get up and uh get on his soapbox there jim what is our credit winner of the week and how can someone win next week uh do you mean who and not what yes so our credit winner this week is kai shafroth i think that's how you say that um and if you want to win Sephiroth? credit next, Kai Sephiroth, not Sephiroth, no. Uh, and if you want to win next week, you should post your question on gatheringmagic.com the day after this cast is live, which should be on Tuesday the sixth. Uh, just post your question in the comments below, and you'll have a chance to win uh, twenty five dollars in store credit. So Kai asks, uh, it feels like we've shifted. We've shifted start slash started shifting to from watch the PT major events to get ahead of the spikes and hot cards to watch the PT major events to get ahead of the sell offs before bans. Has this environment changed how guy you guys approach specs? Um, and there's some other random stuff in there, but basically, it's you know has has the talk of bannings changed how you approach uh, speculation. And I think for the most part, I don't know if necessarily the tournament results are more indicative of a banning rather than um, just following R&D on Twitter and seeing what their responses are to people asking for them specifically. Like, I don't think that, I, I think that maybe in a different world where Aaron Forsyth doesn't say explicitly that, you know, being good doesn't, doesn't mean that it will get banned. 
Uh, maybe a bunch of people try to sell stuff off from Lantern, but like that, I don't know that the whole bunch of those cards are even that expensive anyway. It just kind of feels like trying to stay ahead of this, especially since the Modern Pro Tour is just so r rare now. Like, there's no guarantee there's going to be a Modern Pro Tour again next year. It seems like this was much better received. Following, like, Pro Tour Oath of Gatewatch, was it two years ago at this point? I think Modern was kind of at all-time low, and I think that was ultimately what led to the decision for them to axe it. But trying to, like... It, it just feels like, obviously, there's people out there who expect a Bedlam brother and done very well this weekend. But in terms of trying to stay as a ban list, it just, feels, it just feels so difficult. You're obviously much better off just trying to just sell cards that constant range, just churning things over rather than sit and hope that, you know, your card gets unbanned, which I which I totally disagree with. It just, it just feels ridiculous to me that we kind of have the blood rate spike that happens every january or whatever um I, I honestly think those people would be better off literally just selling those cards and spending that money and they could have sold the blood raids when they didn't got a ban uh at their high bought them again then just rinse and repeat for what this is like the third year running now that this has been the case same with stoneforge mystic um as for the events themselves it feels like modern is kind of an awkward place mainly because there are some dynamic things, but nothing really stood out as being a major financial winner this weekend, other than uh, probably the pieces from Black Red Hollow one. I think that was, um, if you somehow had Goblin Lords and Burning Inquiry, sure, but you would have been better off if you just are flipping uh, Blackleaf Cliffs because it went from being, what, like, Fourteen, fifteen dollars to I think when I looked earlier today, there was a few copies on TC hovering around like close to thirty at this point. So I think you're just better off making the consistent surefire play rather than trying to hope that you get lucky with a, a spec and like a pro tour, like some star save that pays off for you. Any thoughts on that, guys? Didn't. Jim, right? Jim's turn. Yes, sir. No? no? Sorry. No, I, I had to unmute my microphone first. No, I I went first. I talked about it already. Oh, all right. Oh, that must have been when I took my headphones off to grab this box of cards. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you can see what, I see what you're saying, that the timeline has shifted a little bit. You used to watch the Pro Tour and then try and snag the cards afterwards, and now it's you're watching the Pro Tour to get rid of them. Just the process for this has become much more efficient, I guess is the best way to think about it. You kind of got to know a little bit more heading into it, uh, what people are doing. You can't wait until the Pro Tour is on. I guess there's the takeaway, that I, <laughs> the takeaway there is make friends with people on Pro Tour teams and find out what the deck is or try and get info from the floor like instantly, like Friday morning type of thing. But beyond that, there's not a lot you can do other than just try and spec on standard less. But, you know, the standard market had already pushed you in that direction anyway. So, you know, in general, the pro your approach to Pro Tours is basically just a lot more conservative now than it used to be. Um, and, you know, we don't know whether the modern Pro Tour is coming back or not. And even that metagame has become so distributed at this point. You know, nothing's more than like 5% of the format. Cards don't spike quite as hard as they used to there either. So, uh, I don't know. My takeaway is just buy more EDH cards. I think the the good thing is there's sites that have catered to people on the Pro Tour where they exclusively cover uh, the Pro Tour and like who's on what deck in round one. Um, I don't think Wizards has done anything yet to stop financial websites from having people on the floor and like making notes and asking vendors what's selling. Um, I don't think that's something that Wizards cares about. Uh, but if you're subscribed to certain websites, they will tell you which cards are sold out on the floor, what decks people are on after a couple rounds. And that can be just enough time to um, be able to make a quick, like make quick money trying to buy stuff before other people get on it when the deck shows up on camera. Um, the banning stuff is real interesting because I have a lot of players who will not buy into a deck because they think the deck's going to get banned in modern. Um, 
in fact, they've switched to other formats to help compensate from that because they've had so many decks banned out of them, especially my standard players lately. Uh, but I, I feel real bad for them because they've had two years of nothing but bans. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens with Dominaria. But, I mean, if you're a standard player, like you don't even want to play standard at this point. You've gotten so many bans. Just hit it. Just uh, get enraged on stuff. Um, as far as the blood braid thing goes, it used to be you could just pay 50 cents on blood braids, and then once they spiked inevitably, you would keep, make like 50 cents to a dollar on each copy on TCG. Uh, obviously, you'd make more if they bought a set or if they bought a bunch, which happened a lot to me last year. Um, but I mean, even major shops are paying two dollars, two fifty now on blood braids, and they're going for three fifty to four online. Um, so it's it's interesting to see that shops are art not necessarily artificially propping up this uh, price, but the last printing for blood braid was in Eternal Masters, which was a year and a half ago. So it's something to uh, keep in mind that people are really choosing their decks and choosing what they're buying into, predicated on a, a card getting banned or unbanned. Um, I have a guy that collects skull clamps because he likes the art and he's also convinced it'll get unbanned someday. I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm happy to sell him as many skull clamps as he wants every time he comes in. So that, that mentality can be very bad for your wallet if you are very, very deep on a card. Uh, but if you were deep on Blood Braid, it's starting oh, to pay You're very, very dumb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after he buys all the $7 Heliods, Travis, you got to hit him with the $5 Skull Clamps, right? So, um, yeah, it's a combo. It clamps the tokens and draws you two cards. Exactly. Uh, it's just like an interesting thing uh, to notice, especially with how NTG Finance is, especially in the last two to three years, it's become more of like uh, who's holding the the bag last versus like people getting in early and uh, making a profit and getting out and moving on to the next thing. So it's just an interesting uh, pattern that's evolved over the years. Jim, you have any other good questions from our viewers for this week? Uh, I closed the tab, so no. Classic Jim every week. Yeah, you asked me what the winner is this week, not all of the good questions. It's, it's Ed's job to answer the questions anyway. He's the one that's lacking. Can confirm. And if you if Ed did not answer your question, he will be at GP Toronto this weekend. Um, so if you want to have some words with him, have fun, guys. I thought Mog Infestation was on the reserve list, but apparently it's not. Is that from Tempest? Stronghold? Stronghold. Stronghold. Okay. The sick EDH card, by the way. If you guys have never seen this, five mana sorcery red, destroy all creatures target player controls. And then for each creature they destroyed, they get two one one goblin tokens. So it just blows up all of one player's creatures, which is especially good if you have Aether Flash in play, because it just kills all their tokens. And if you really want to get them, you have Burning Sands in play, which is whenever a creature of theirs a con a creature dies, its controller sacks the land. So you just blow up all their creatures and then they all die to Aether Flash and then they sacrifice all their lands. It's good stuff. I mean, or you could just Mog Infestation yourself and make a shit ton of goblin tokens and kill them. I have done that too. Yes, but have you ever pulled up viewer questions in time? Jim, you got them ready? <laughs> no, I didn't. I got them. I got the one question that I knew I needed at the beginning of the cast. Oh, beforehand I, I was ready i was not ready for the second one okay apparently i have some eidolon and great rebels didn't that spike a while ago they're back down to seven what were they were they they're like 20 bucks at one point or something rip 14s uh 13 on goldfish was a peak so that's not too bad i'll take it All what right. are we doing what's <clears throat> going on here apparently i'm looking up new questions well, I'm in front of me, so I will just answer some of the ones. Some of these were from last week, so it feels a little le less relevant since uh, we're kind of past our Pro Tour. I've got a good one. All right. Jim cannot apparently load a website. That's not true. I'm looking. I'm reading them right now. You said you didn't want a bad one, and there's the first one that says specifically you should not read it. Brian Vander Yuck, who listens to this cast a lot. Vander, Vander Juke? I, I don't know. 
Hey crew, I have noticed that Modern Masters 3 reprints have started rebounding. With a successful Modern Pro Tour in the books and confidence in the format, do you think we could see rebounds in iconic Masters and Modern Masters reprints soon? So will Iconic Masters rebound? I think we can all say no. At least not anytime really? soon. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Uh, it depends on how much it... Like, it depends on time, I suppose. Not necessarily, like, what cards are in it. I don't think it's Boxes really are time. so cheap, Jim. They're so cheap. You can't have rebounding so. singles prices if boxes are still this low. Hey, a pile of training grounds. Yeah, but I, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, usually we kind of see a trend where boxes start to get more expensive because they become more rare. And then as a result, the price of singles just naturally creep up because the, the, the supply is dwindling and the demand is still there. Here we just have a case where there's just infinite supply and quite literally zero demand for it. Like, it's a, like if you look at eBay or any of the Facebook groups, like people are basically just trying to give this stuff away. Um, like on eBay, you can buy them roughly at the same price that it costs like a store to buy from a distributor. Um, that being said, there will be some cards that will continue to have demand something like, you know, lightning helix. We're at the point where you can buy Conic masters, lightning helixes for, I think like under dollar 50 or something at this point. It, Lightning Helix is just like a card where Bird will always be a deck. There will never be ever be a better Lightning Helix. Um, like at some point that card will probably like be north of two dollars, probably three dollars again at some point. Uh, up until we had that reprint uh, in iconic, it kind of felt like you uh you were definitely paying like three to four dollars on old Lightning Helixes. Um, that being said, there's still a lot of like smaller cards are missing, which maybe we'll see in uh, twenty five. But as for iconic, like I've I've just kind of written it off. I think there's I think there's just no hope for iconic in any shape or form. I mean, um, Jim's turn. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Well, I I just want to I'll play devil's advocate here. Eternal Masters was reprinted, like got a reprint and was also sitting on shelves and eventually became worth something, right? Like some of the cards are worth something in that set. We never had prices at what shops could buy it at on eBay. Like boxes went down to like 165, 170. Iconic Masters started selling at 165, 170. It's a big difference. Okay, well, I think there's hope for it eventually, just not very soon. Well, we will see. I mean, right. that's, that, well, that's my problem is like, you say like, I, you know, we'll see it eventually, like eventually it's too long with time frame at this point. And I used to, I used to be all about that. It was like, buy the cards, sit on them for a couple of years, get your rotation going. It worked out really well, but man, they've just hammered these reprints for the last year and a half. And I feel like they basically stamped out all of the pent up demand that are left in these formats and it would take it would take years for a lot of these cards to really climb back up to where you'd see a meaningful profit whereas you used to be able to do it in like a couple months um so i i don't know i i think that you know modern you will see occasional modern cards spike like you know a, like if, imagine a hollow one deck with some new card that nobody had figured out before you know somebody breaks trade roots or hatching plans please break trade roots or hatching plans but until you know if those don't happen uh, you're not you're not getting a sudden influx of popularity into this stuff. Even humans, which would have moved the needle like crazy on all those staples four years ago, bumped some of this stuff a little bit, but not that much. Um, you know, the, you're you're not going to get that type of activity until you have a new format, essentially. All right. Well, let's move into pick of the week, where Jim can pick um, iconic masters boxes, I guess. Ed, what do you have this week? Uh, Vraska Contempt. It's the type of card where we've seen this in Heroes Downfall before. I mean, obviously that was a little bit different because Mono Black was just far and away the best deck in that format, and it probably had an unhealthy percentage share of the meta. Um, that being said, Vraska Contempt is a type of card where it's twelve bucks. What? It's twelve bucks. 
what is 12 bucks right, right now? Yep. It's not 12 bucks right now. It's 12 bucks right now. No, I, I don't believe you. But uh, regardless, I think this is the type of card where if you don't, if you don't already have it, pick up a set. It has for forty eight dollars. Yeah, for forty eight dollars <laughs> because we sold eighteen copies while I was in the shop today at twelve dollars each. Oh, They're twelve okay. bucks, bud. Want to want to have okay. a new pick? No. <laughs> uh okay. Maybe don't go deep on this card. Don't buy like <laughs> <laughs> don't buy like infinite <laughs> copies. But this is the type of card where if you have it, it will be it will be very good for life time that it's in standard uh especially since ixlon cards are starting to dwindle we're uh in in the store we're at the point where we don't have more ixlon cards to sell because we sold all of them already and we're not willing to open up ixlon boxes because trying to play that lottery is just terrible so now we're kind of at this awkward point where okay what do we do with three stocking ixlon cards now i mean obviously i can have a buy list out but it seems like most people are just kind of holding on, especially since Standard doesn't really have a lot of spotlight on it right now. And Standard is still kind of open uh, until we have some event that kind of solves the format, as it were. But uh, I think this card is a fine hold. I definitely could see a game more expensive. It'll kind of be a mainstay. We've already seen it played in decks in the past. Blue Black Controls, Hold High Energy or whatever. Um, and if we kind of had this... Might go up to thirteen dollars, guys. You gotta watch out. You're ridiculous. Um, with with kind of the uh, the axing of Ram- Ramnap Red, there's like not really a premier Ramy aggro Nap? deck out there. What? Ramnap? Is that what I said? Ramnap. Ramnap Red. Oh, man, what my Ramnap? Uh, Ram- Ramunap. Ramunap. If if decks just kind of head towards mid range, kind of standard that we've had in the past, then this will just be one of the best cards out there. Like I'm trying, trying to give our listeners, today. trying to give our listeners a little more character than just the four of us speaking into the camera for thirty second sound bites each. Get a little camaraderie going. I'm just gonna okay, take we the can form make fun of Jim for not coming all of you for your pronunciations. <laughs> I mean, you could do that if you want, but. Toronto is really far away, and I'm getting married this year, so I have to spend money on other things that are not going to Toronto. You cannot get married and go to Toronto. I could, but then my fiance would be really mad. Well, she Maybe might not be money. doing that. It depends. <laughs> are you at least going to go to a Leafs game while you're up there? I am planning on going, yes. Okay. Let me know how this, the uh, arena is. I, I like to go there eventually, but it's not in the cards right now. Yeah, sorry, bud. Yeah, man, hockey is great. All right, Jim, what's your pick of the week? My pick this week is Horn of Greed. It is less than a dollar on TCG Player right now, and it is one of the most played cards in Azusa EDH decks. And since Azusa is getting reprinted, and it was previously a $40 card, and in the top 10 mono green commanders... I can see a lot of people building a deck with her now because it's not going to be forty or fifty dollars to buy the Azusa, which is a lot. It's a pretty big investment for a single card in, in Commander. Um, so I'm I'm pretty big. Whatever deck ends up playing Azusa is also going to want Horn of Greed, even if it's not an Azusa deck. So my pick this week is Horn of Greed. Uh, it got reprinted recently in Conspiracy, so there's plenty of them out there. You can find a lot of them for less than a dollar. Um, I can't see how you go wrong with this. Eventually, it's going to go up. My pick is Screw Wizards for reprinting all of the cards that I have in my spec box. What the hell? Also, breaking and entering and beck and call. Bunch of assholes. Um, I have an anti-pick of the week. Uh, you should not pick Vraska's Contempt. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, we we have pretty good reason to believe that uh, in the near future we're going to see return to return to Ravnica. I don't remember. If, I don't think there was nothing. Was there something spoiled, or was this just rumor? Like I don't remember the what story. It was that we were the talking. story confirmed that they will be going back to Ravnica at some point. 
Okay. We're going to get shock lands when we go back to Ravnica. Nothing is 100%, but it is a very high chance that we're going to go back to Ravnica. So if you've been stashing any duels away for a while, like I have been, now is a good time to ship those. Other so shock lands, stuff like Stomping Ground, Sacred Foundry, all that good stuff. Because it's really likely we're going to see them come back, and you're going to get hammered hard if you still hold any copies. And if we don't come back, it's not like prices and you sold all yours. It's not like prices are going to go wild and you're going to miss out. Like we've had a ton of time for those cards to move in price. They've done what they're going to do. Get out while the getting's good and move on to greener pastures. So sell all of your spare shocks. It's been five years since shock lens now, right? So, so I want to, I want to, I want to make a counter to that argument. I think that if you have shock lands and they get reprinted, you probably want to keep them. Um, because the last time we got reprinted dual lands, they actually went up in price. Everyone remembers the Ixalan um, check lands. They were like two times, three times as much money when they got reprinted in standard again for like a couple of weeks. Yeah, but weren't they like, they're like free at the start. I mean, the Innistrad check lands before that, aside from like Solver Falls, were all quite no, no, cheap. Not the Innistrad that. ones. These are the, these are the buddy lands from the end sets. These are the right. allied color ones. These are the ones that have been reprinted forever and ever and ever and were worth basically nothing and then were worth like $6. Yeah, I mean, like, so you had several prints of these cards. They were worth almost nothing. Nothing. Suddenly they're all legal again. So stores, instead of charging 25 cents, can charge like $1.50 or $2. If you own those cards, it's still kind of a pain in the butt to flip them. But we're talking about cards that already have price tags, right? You're talking about cards that are like at $10, $12 for non-foils and like what, like 20 and 30 for foils. So they're going to be legal again, but I don't, I don't see those spiking as hard because they already have a real price tag as opposed to essentially being free like those check lands were. Well, the other thing that to note is that they don't usually reprint cards in standard with the same art if they're not in a core set. So these new Ravnica shocks are going to get new art if they do get reprinted. If you really like the art from the Return to Ravnica and Gatecrash ones, it doesn't make sense to sell them then. Well, I'm not saying you should sell every copy you own, but sell the ones you've been holding for profit. The thing is, it's uncertainty, right? Like you have a you have a a event that has a lot of uncertainty in it. Uh, so if you can sell now and take profits, the upside is much lower, I would argue, than the downside. So I would just be looking to get out of the way of that speeding train. You do what you will. If you think they're going to go up, go for it. I, I mean, the shock lines were pretty happened. expensive the last time they were in standard. They actually went down when they left despite being played in modern pretty heavily like it with the exception i think of steam vents steam vents was the only one that went up and everything else went down like the shock lines in there in standard like 15 to 18 dollars for the the very popular ones i agree with travis i think that there's too many out there um i like waiting maybe another month or two to get out of them uh but i do agree getting out of them by the end of 2018 is probably a good idea um, oh, the the other thing you could do is just like sell your shocks, take your profits, buy more shocks at buy list, and then sell them again, which is like probably Ed's strategy. But if you just have a bunch of shocks sitting around and you're like I waiting mean, buy, for a while. Buying cards for buy list and reselling them seems like yeah, a good idea. Right. Um, like I think that taking your profits on extra ones after four or five years isn't a bad idea. So that's that's I agree with Travis here. If you have like a couple hundred dollars in shock lands or even like an extra set of steam vents, uh, maybe it's time to list those, to take the money and wait for a better opportunity to purchase any other card or the reprinted shocks. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, I agree with Travis here. My pick of the week. Let's play the guessing game. It's an uncommon from Alara and Eternal Masters. And it's an artifact. Her. What? I said Tide Hollow Sculler. Nope, it's an artifact. Tide Hollow Sculler is an artifact. Colorless. And it was printed in Alara Block and Eternal Masters. Mm. And 5th edition, I think. On, and man. Antiquities. What? Card's name is Ashnod's Altar. This is an EDH All Star. How's that card Alara Block? block? What? When was that? When was that printed in a Lara block? Which set? It's not in a Lara oh, at all. <laughs> I thought I thought it's the wrong card. It's relic of progenitor. Oh my god! That card is definitely in fifth edition, guys. You should double check that. Yeah. 
So, so just to be clear, none of the clues, clues you gave were correct. Because <laughs> you so, started so, with Relic, which was fine, and then you blended into <laughs> Ashman's Altar, and there was no point we could get that correct at that. Yeah, um, you're, like you said, Antiquities, 5th Edition, and Eternal Masters. And I was like, I don't think any of those cards have been in all of those sets in Alara, because Alara didn't have that many reprints. It's like Middling Mage, and I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, like anyway, Trinity. this card is going from... Uh, two dollars low. It's now at three fifty low. Mid is now five dollars. I think in a couple of months, especially with Hollow One decks and all this other stuff out there, I think this is a five dollar low, seven dollar mid card. Um, I think this is going to happen by June. This is a card that we can't keep in stock for a variety of formats, including but not limited to EDH, even with the new Graveyard Hoser out there, out of uh, Rivals of Ixalan. And it's a card that Bylas have started to go up on quite a bit if you look at some of the uh, Bylas scrapers. And it's just a card to keep in mind. Um, I thought this card was still like $3 mid, and when we were selling them, and I was looking at repricing them, I was astonished at how fast this card's been climbing. The The graph for this card looks really good. So that's something that I, I just really like, is like a quick 20 to 30% gainer. Um, what card was it? I forgot. Relic of Progenitus. Relic of Progenitus. Yeah, Ashnod's Altar already went back up. But uh, that's another one that I've had on my mind for a while. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So where can people find you guys? Uh, do you remember Codsluck of the Great Distortion? That was disappointing. I don't want to talk about how many of those I have. <sighs> Not a good idea. Uh, I also have a lot of those. We'll see. Maybe eventually we'll get lucky. Ed, where can people find you? Uh, at Edwin13 on Twitter, uh, I will at some point go back to answering Gathering Magic questions. I've been uh, slacking on that, as it were. I'll also be happy to answer your questions, as Jeremy said, live in Toronto this weekend. Slacking off. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what time I'll get there. I think I'm flying in, because I don't want to drive eight hours, so I'll probably take the train down to New York City and then fly, which is... Arguably the same amount of time, but slightly more efficient and less boring. And I and you can miles. sleep. You can sleep. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, I can sleep. That, that is that is important. So I will yeah, definitely but, be on site by but Friday. But you never sleep. We know that. I slept for sixteen hours the other day. It was great. I forgot what that felt like. Uh, after Toronto, I will be at Pokemon Regionals in St. Louis. Boo. And yeah, not, not not thrilled about driving through St. Louis into the great state of Illinois uh, for regionals. I yep. may be a, I may be in Memphis. I'm not sure about that one, but I'll be uh, there. No, okay. Well, I guess I have to go then. Apparently. Yep. Anything else, Ed? No. Jim. My name is Jim Casal. You can find me on Twitter at phrost underscore. You can find me on Gathering Magic. Every other week, and you find me on, I don't know, in the OK city of Orlando. Orlando is fine. I like GP Orlando last year. I said the OK city of Orlando, not like the Oklahoma city of Orlando, like the reasonable but not great but not awful city of Orlando. I think Orlando falls well above average. Well, then you're going to be really disappointed when you go to Collinsville next week. Sorry, I already, know that, I already know that's well below average. Yeah. Travis, where can people find you? I am Travis Allen. I am on Twitter at WizardBumpin, B-U-M-P-I-N. I write every Monday at MTG Price, the Watchtower series. I also do the MTG Fast Finance podcast. And do you like it when I harass the other guys in the cast? Please tell us in the comments whether I should give them more of a hard time about how they pronounce things or if I should leave them alone. I'm Jeremy. You can find me along with Travis at GP Toronto this weekend. I will be at GP, the French GP next weekend. I heard that this airport is the worst, one of the worst airports in the world to fly into and try to get around. So I can't wait to have a miserable time there. Um, the following week, I will be at GP Memphis. And then the week after that is the Legacy 5K for a charity in which Star City Games and a bunch of other game shops have donated prizes on top of $5,000 cash um, that we will be giving towards the Cancer Research Institute. Both myself and Douglas Johnson will be vending that event. So if there's anybody that uh, listens to either of the cast, feel free to come down and say hi, because we have to make Doug dress nicely for once instead of cargo shorts. Uh, as always, you can find our cast at cartel underscore finance. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. 
You can find us on SoundCloud. You can find us on YouTube. And you can always find us at gatheringmagic.com. We'll see you guys next week. Don't forget to leave questions. We appreciate the views, and we'll get back to you real soon. Bye.